Hello, everybody. I think we're going to get started, and we may have a few more people join us from the waiting room uh, as we uh, get going. But I wanted to uh, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Joanna Schnedler. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Music Coalition, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Alexandria Mueller, who's here with us today, too. Uh, she is an attorney at Helmuth & Johnson and a member of the board of directors for the Minnesota Music Coalition. So thank you so much for, um, for bringing this, uh, this idea of a workshop to, to us um, as something that is, is really timely and really important for musicians and other people in the music industry to be thinking about right now. Uh, so I will pass this along to you. And I'll, I will also say, if anyone uh, has questions that come along, please feel free to put those in the chat. Thank you, Alex. All right. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I'll just add, in addition to being an entertainment attorney, I'm a professional composer. I write uh, film music and concert music, and I decided to go to law school as the result of being an independent published musician, and so here we are. I, I've done that legwork for you, and I will share what I know, and then you will be good at this, too. Um, I'm going to share my screen, which is a PowerPoint that is posted on the MMC page, so you'll be able to get it. Um, feel free to take notes, but you don't have to take uh, everything down because you'll have access to this PowerPoint afterwards. And then as Joanna said, if you want to drop questions in the chat as we go, we'll also have some time at the end. <laughs> so, okay, so this PowerPoint is uh, designed by myself in order to work when it's printed, so you'll notice that it's very utilitarian. So first, let's cover a little bit about music copyright basics. The U.S. Copyright Act is Title 17 of the United States Code. The six rights, I will, you'll hear me refer to them in the plural because there's six of them. Um, sometimes they're referred to as a bundle of sticks because you can actually parse them out individually. They don't have to move in one chunk. So there's six of them in the U.S. Copyright Act, Section 106. The first one is reproduce the work. Second one is prepare derivative works. Distribute copies or phono records, sound recordings. Number four, perform the work publicly. Number five, display the work. And number six is perform the work by means of digital audio transmission. And I have it highlighted in red here under number four and number six for you because number four applies to the musical work. So this is a performance right that's going to apply to the sheet music or what would be on the sheet music. Number six only applies to the sound recording and only applies to digital audio. Not, not video, not radio, nothing else, just digital audio streaming. So under the copyright law, the sound recording is considered a separate work with its own copyrights. And the musical work, the song, the lyrics, what would be on the sheet music is referred to as a musical work. And that also has its own set of six copyrights. So keep this in mind as we're going through the rights and the revenue streams, because this is important to understand. They may be owned by different people. Probably in a lot of cases, everyone that's on this webinar, you own both, but they can be owned by different people and they can go different places. So anywhere the sound recording goes, it's going to bring along rights that affect the musical work, but the musical work is able to go places the sound recording can't, you know, selling sheet music, things like that. Now, the music industry describes those six rights in a little bit different way. We won't go through every one of these in great detail today, but the synchronization, synchronization right, also called the sync right, that applies to the musical work. This is the ability to synchronize the music with an audiovisual presentation. The master use right is the right to use a particular sound recording. So if you're a filmmaker, you actually need both of those things in order to use a song in a film or a trailer. You need the sync right and the master use license. 
Mechanical rights is a big part of what we're talking about today. Um, a little history here. These originated with the piano roll. If you have ever seen a player piano, there's that cylinder with holes punched in it. You load that into the mechanism of the player piano, and then it plays the music. And so it's a machine reproduction of the sheet music, and that's why it's called the mechanical right. The performance right, this is the number four that we're talking about. If you remember from the six rights, the derivative right is you know making an arrangement or an adaptation, changing the lyrics, things like that. Grand rights have to do with things that are performed dramatically, so musical theater, opera, stuff like that, where people are wearing costumes. You know, it's not it's not just someone on stage singing the song. There's some dramatic aspect to it. There might be scenery and that sort of thing. And then, of course, sheet music is the print right. So performing rights generate a lot of royalties because of the usages. The way that these royalties are collected is by performing rights organizations. In the U.S., there are four. ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and there's a new one, Global Music Rights. These are non-government entities, nonprofits that are tasked with collecting performance royalties on behalf of songwriters and publishers. They are a sort of clearinghouse. Um, the first one was established way back in 1911. ASCAP is the oldest one, founded by cellist Victor Herbert. And the principle behind it was that people wouldn't necessarily report that they were using music. Victor Herbert, as the story goes, was at a cafe. There was a cabaret performance of some of his songs, and the performers were really terrible. And so he proposed the idea that if we produced the sheet music and went through all the trouble of writing the music and we have to suffer through other people performing our music, then we should at least get paid for that. And so the idea of a performance royalty came about, and they didn't trust the publishers to collect this, so they created the performing rights organizations to collect on behalf of the publishers so that they couldn't hide music Hide, sorry, hide money from their songwriters. So these are not royalties that are paid by the publisher or by the songwriter. These royalties are paid by the music user. So if it's broadcast on television, the, the TV program or the TV station is paying ASCAP, just for instance, money, and then ASCAP pays the writer and the publisher of that song for their song being used on a TV show. ASCAP will also pay a royalty if that's if a piece is performed on a recital at a school concert, if it's performed on the radio. And these are paying the musical work side, the publishing side. Half of that money is going to go to the publisher and half is going to go to the songwriters. If there's more than one songwriter, they will split it between themselves and those percentages don't have to be totally equal that can be modified by contract. But this is only talking about the musical work. Okay. So writers can only belong to one PRO at a time, which means that each one of these organizations has a unique catalog of music. To qualify to join, you need to have commercially released a recording or have a qualifying public performance. This can be you performing it. It just has to be out in public, and you have documentation that shows, you know, like a program or something, a set list that shows you performed your music in public. Um, if you're self-published, you would also join the PRO as your own publisher. ASCAP actually has you set up a second account for this. BMI doesn't. They just sort of lump it together. And then if you're self-administered in ASCAP, you're going to collect 100% they define it, you know, the total amount due is 100%, and so they say 50 goes to the publisher, 50 goes to the writer. You would collect all of that, but 50 would go through your publisher account and 50 would go through your writer account. In BMI, they labeled each side as 100%, so it's 100% of the publisher side and 100% of the writer's side, and you will collect both of that. You would have 200%, so... You don't get more money from being with BMI. They just defined the total differently, if that makes sense. As we said, this music comes 
the money for the music usage comes from the music users, uh, venues, television networks, the streaming service, the radio station. Oftentimes it's done with blanket licensing. So like if you're a university, for example, you pay a yearly fee and you can perform any of the music that ASCAP represents. You pay a yearly fee to BMI, and you can perform any of the music that BMI represents. So you pay more than one license, but you don't have to pay for each song independently. And that's a really big deal because it makes it really convenient for the music users and really easy to get music performed then. Those blanket license fees generate a pool of money and then the PROs track what songs are actually used. They kind of work backwards off of programs that are submitted. And they also do surveys. So they'll turn on the TV a certain day of the month, and they'll be like, okay, what songs are being played, and then that writer will get paid for it. So it's not totally precise, but they try to track what's actually being used and then pay you proportionately. Okay, just a special note about YouTube. Um, sync licenses are not something that the PROs can grant. The sync license itself, so the license you need in order to put the song in your video, has to come from the publisher. What comes from ASCAP is when you then show your video on television, they administer the license that, for the broadcast part of it. Now, with YouTube, there's a special arrangement because of cover songs and the idea that people are just using that as a platform to perform virtually. So they said they approached the big publishers and ASCAP and all the PROs agreed to this, that you can have a blanket license that YouTube pays for. And this is why you can post you know, yourself playing a song on YouTube and it will stay there. Um, not every single song is in the blanket license. I'd actually tormented an ASCAP rep for a long time, a month ago, trying to figure out exactly how this works and the problems with it. Because unlike when you report your own set list, like if you play at a bar, you can report your own set list and make sure that you, know, you would get paid for your own songs, for example, if they're on the set list. There's no way to do that on YouTube ahead of time. So you're sort of stuck wondering for sure what's in that blanket license or not. So one way to, to check is if there's a lot of the song uploaded, it's probably in the blanket license. And if you can't find any recordings of it, it's probably not in the blanket license. But there's no list to check. If it is in the blanket license, you'll typically get a claim on it, but not a takedown. If you're familiar with YouTube, you've probably seen both. And it can, the algorithm can detect, you know, unlisted or unpublic videos as well as ones that are made public. And it can even detect it because of how it's tracking. It can even detect it if you've changed the instrumentation. But the more genuine it sounds like the original recording, the more likely the algorithm is to find it. All right. A little bit more history. So... As we said, originally there's no performance royalties under number four in section 106. There's no performance royalties going to the sound recording at all. They were left out. The reason for that was because the record labels had lobbied that sound recordings didn't qualify for public performance. They weren't even given their own copyright. They were considered a derivative work for a long time before 1972. And in the 1990s, the internet started in 1995. Congress amended the Copyright Act to add to Section 106 that sixth right, the one that applies to digital performance for sound recordings. So now sound recording owners can get paid a performance royalty when their music is streamed online. So that's not going to apply to you know, YouTube or anything like that, but audio only. So along with that, new right came a new entity to collect for that right, and that's SoundExchange. SoundExchange collects royalties on behalf of the sound recording owners and the record labels. They pay 50% to the label, and then 45% to the featured artist, the recording artist, and 5% of that goes into a fund that pays for the union session players. So this 
is a chart which hopefully helps clarify some of this. So you see here in the top example we have broadcast radio. Um, this is a unique situation in the U.S. In other countries, sound recording owners do get paid for radio play, but in the U.S. they do not. So we only have this upper red, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not, I realized. Um, the upper red branch here is for the musical composition, that's what they used to MC for. So you see this radio broadcast is generating money that goes to the PROs, and the PROs pay 50% to the songwriter, 50% to the publisher. Oh, good, thanks Daniel, you can see my pointer. So then if we look at the, the bottom example here, we have a webcast, and this is any sort of thing like Pandora, Sirius XM, internet streaming. We have a branch now for the musical composition as before, but we also have a branch for SR, the sound recording. And sound exchange is the entity that's collecting that. And then you see, as we said, 50% goes to the record label, 45% to the performer, the featured performers, and then 5% is going to the SAG fund, and they have their own way of figuring out who's entitled to share in that, and then they distribute that to their players and the singers. Okay. So this is a chart that shows the on-demand streams or interactive streaming, which is different than what we just looked at, which is passive or non-interactive. So non-interactive behaves like radio does. It's just there's music playing. You don't have control over what plays next. On demand, you do. If you type in a certain song, you're going to hear that song. And this is important because when the stream is on demand or interactive, it triggers the mechanical royalty. So mechanical royalty first appears in physical media, as we talked about, machine things. So in the digital space, I'll go back. The physical space, this would have been vinyls, CDs, things like that. Every time you sell a CD, a mechanical royalty gets paid on the sale price of that CD to the publisher, and then they pay a share to the artist as they agreed to. So in the digital space, we have permanent downloads doing the same sort of thing. They just decided, oh, that's analogous, so we'll treat it the same way. So this is things like Amazon, iTunes, downloads. So you have what's here shown happening is the statutory rate. This can be changed by the record deal. They might pay less than that if it's a song controlled composition, a song written by their own artist. But you're generating a royalty here for the publisher in the form of a mechanical. And an on-demand stream, we have Oh, sorry, I see a question from Daniel. If you're not on a label, we have another slide coming up for if you're using something like an aggregator. So this comes up less and less with people not pressing physical discs. Just it makes more sense if we talk about it in order of how it used to work and then how it works now. So in the physical sense, you, you, know, you used to have a more gatekeeper control over everything, and it would have been the record label dealing with this and paying the, the mechanicals out. And now we have other, other sorts of middlemen, so on the next slide. Um, okay, back to the bottom thing here. This is on-demand streaming, as I said, also called interactive streaming. So what this is generating is multiple types of royalties. So we have our first prong, the, the usual performance royalty going to the musical composition that's being collected by the PROs. We have this sound recording performance royalty collected by sound exchange going to the record label, or it might be collected by the record label directly. There's some choices here, but sound exchange is generally the one in charge of the performance royalty for the sound recording. PROs are generally in charge of the performance royalty for the musical composition. There's a third prong here, and this is the streaming mechanical royalty. So how the Music Modernization Act, as we're going to come up with in a little bit, this is the prong that got changed and improved. So this will end up with more people getting paid. Okay. Here's a slide for if you are independent. 
So if you're using something like an aggregator, then you have your aggregator in here collecting. You have possibly them in here collecting mechanicals. You might have them affiliated with Harry Fox collecting mechanicals. You can end up with a lot of different middlemen involved just in the streams of revenue. And then up here, this is permanent downloads again. That one's a little more straightforward because it's just off of the unit sale price. Are we good so far? I don't want to talk really fast. This is a lot of information. Okay. So that's kind of the lay of the land coming up to the changes. So prior to the Music Modernization Act, those mechanical licensing were organized as a direct system. So you had either going directly to the publisher and saying, you know, we're going to press 100,000 discs of this song and we'll pay you 9.1 cents for each one. And they're like, okay, cool. Or you could go th through the compulsory license if you're doing, you know, a cover song, for instance, and same sort of thing. It's like you would pay, Harry Fox is the, the entity that often administers those, and you would pay the statutory rate, the 9.1 cents, under the compulsory license. And this isn't super important for what we're talking about regarding cover songs, but you can't release a cover song until the original artist has done so. So the copyright owner gets the right to make that first recording. So if you write the song, you have the right to release the first recording. And no one can do a cover of your song until you have made the first recording. Now you can give that away to someone else. Like maybe you're a great writer, but you're terribly stage shy and don't want to be on a record. You can, you know, give the performance away to someone else to make the first record. But you have the right to do that and to decide who's recording it. Um, one of the biggest drawbacks to this system was that you have to research every single work on its own to figure out who owns it. And it's complicated. You might be able to find the record label, you know, off the liner notes or something, but they might be a subsidiary of another company. They may have merged their contact info changed, and then you still have to find the music publisher and the copyright database isn't totally filled out because not everything gets registered and not everything is easy to find. So what happened when services like Spotify launched is that the system just really wasn't scalable. Um, there's a risk for any streaming service that, you know, they have millions of tracks, they're supposed to clear every single one of these, they just don't have the infrastructure to do it, so they started using what's called a notice of intent, which is sort of a cover your butt strategy that, oh, well, we tried to find the copyright owners and we couldn't, and so we'll file this thing called a notice of intent with the copyright office, and then if we find them later, we'll pay them, but we don't have to. And just so you know, like we tried, kind of. And so they filed something like 9 million NOIs. The Copyright Office was very upset. The songwriters are all very upset. Um, many rights holders went unpaid just because the systems couldn't find it. So the Music Modernization Act, this was all being discussed. It was passed finally in 2018. It's an amendment to the Copyright Act. So the thing that we now call the Music Modernization Act actually has three different things in it. The one that we're focused on today is Title I, which is called the Musical Works Modernization Act. There's some other changes that happened. One of them has to do with pre-1972 sound recordings and Title III, which has to do with just making what Sound Exchange had been doing for a long time anyway, which was allowing artists to split money with their producer by sending a letter of direction and saying like, hey, pay part of my percent to my producer. They made that into the law. So now it's not just something Sound Exchange does because they felt like it. Now it's actually part of the Copyright Act that you can do that. Um, so the Musical Works Modernization Act 
is what affected the mechanical licensing system that was just not working in the age of the DSPs, digital service providers. So it changed the eligibility for that compulsory license and created a blanket license. And a blanket license is one that includes all kinds of eligible works instead of having to go one by one and find every single rights holder and get a license for every single song. So they created a mechanical licensing collective, which is not a PRO, but it is supposed to function a lot like a PRO, as you'll see in a bit. The digital service providers are the ones paying for this. The board of this organization is made up of publishers, songwriters, and the service users, the digital service providers like Spotify and those streaming services are the ones paying for it. So it's kind of a cool arrangement that who's, you know, the one using it is not the one that's solely in charge of it. The idea is that there's some checks and balances there. The mechanical licensing collective's job is to collect mechanical royalties for that blanket license and distribute those to publishers, self-administered songwriters, and foreign collection agencies, which are abbreviated as, as CMOs. The other super important thing that the MLC is supposed to do is create a database of all the musical works so that we don't have this problem of not being able to quickly find who owns what. So the Mechanical Licensing Collective decided to name itself the Mechanical Licensing Collective. They abbreviate as MLC. They're a nonprofit similar to the PROs. So they were designated by the U.S. Copyright Office to do this job. Their board is 14 members. Ten of those are from music publisher world, and four of them have to be, this is in the rules, four of them have to be professional songwriters who are independent. They may maintain their own publishing, and they would be collecting mechanicals themselves. So MLC's job, as we said, is to establish... Sorry, I did something to my screen. Establish and maintain that database of musical works ownership information. They'll administer this new blanket license for U.S. mechanical rights to digital audio services. They are going to receive and match sound recording usage data from the audio services with their database, and they're going to collect and distribute those royalties. Ta-da! Here's their logo. So this blanket license launches in January of next year, which is why we're in a preparatory phase right now. Um, the MLC is the only one that's going to be able to grant this blanket license. And any digital service provider that uses the blanket license has to pay that money to the MLC. The MLC doesn't keep anything. All of their overhead is being paid for by the DSPs. They are going to pass through 100% of what they collect to the publishers, the songwriters, composers, lyricists, etc. So this blanket license that we're talking about, it's for the digital service providers. It's not something like that you or I could get unless we start a new company that's like a Spotify. So the rates are going to be set by the Copyright Royalty Board, just as the rates are set for other types of performance royalties. Those are determined by a court, a specialized court in New York every couple of years. They set what the rate's going to be. And then the MLC is only going to collect digital mechanicals in the United States. So these are coming from things like interactive streams, limited downloads, permanent downloads. That's not covering those CDs or any type of physical media. It's not covering videos, whether those are streamed or downloaded. It's not covering, it's the public performance side of the musical work. You still need to be with your PRO to collect that. It's not covering the sound recording, digital performance royalty that is covered by Sound Exchange. And the blanket license is not going to apply if a publisher decides they're going to deal with something like Spotify directly. I know there's a couple publishers that announced, like with Apple Music, that they're doing direct deals and they're not going to go through the MLC. So here's the new landscape. So over here, we have, they've, they've broken this down, kind of talking about the rights, if you remember from the early slide with the six rights. So that's what these are up here. 
And then these are all the actors underneath here. So here's our old system, performance rights. Here is our records as they're distributed. Here is our 106.6 digital performance right with sound exchange there. And then here's the new mechanical licensing scheme. So we have the MLC in here or possibly someone else if you're going direct because remember they only collect from the DSPs for their blanket license. They don't do anything else. So if you're going to make a cover song, you don't ask the MLC. You need to ask, you know, Harry Fox is still the place to start for that. And then you see that their money gets passed down and their money gets passed down and the end result is we want all money getting to the songwriters. I can't see the chat anymore. Um, I want to check in and see if there's questions. No question right now. Just a uh, comment. Super helpful chart. Thanks for laying this out. Oh, okay. Cool. All right. Pressing on. So this is the inner workings of the MLC on this chart. They've got some nice slogans that they made. So they want you to connect to collect. You want you to become a member. You want to play your part, which means register your works, just like you would register them all with your PRO. You're going to need to register them with the MLC. So everyone's feeding all this information into the MLC's portal. The MLC is going to track what's being used by Spotify and so forth, and then they're going to pay it out to the people who are supposed to get paid. Now, there's... A lot of questions about what's going to happen with the money that like Spotify has a big black box of royalties right now that they haven't paid out. The MLC has this sort of side project where they're going to try and sort that out. So they're going to look retroactively and as they're getting started, they're going to go back a couple years and try and figure out where that money is supposed to be. After a couple years go by, they can't figure out where it belongs then they are going to distribute it anyway. So it's going to be, they haven't figured out exactly what's happening with it, but it's likely not going to the right people at that point. It's just going as sort of a pro rata share, like here, industry have this back. It belongs to the songwriters. We'll give it to some songwriters somewhere. So they haven't totally worked out what's happening with that yet. They're hoping that they can match as much as possible and avoid, you know, stuff basically going to the wrong party, but they're definitely, they're not keeping it and Spotify's not keeping it, just so you know. So that's still in flux, but. Okay, should you join the MLC? If you're self-administered, you should definitely join. Question, if you are self-administered, so do you have a music publishing deal where you signed away your copyright? Are you working with a publishing rights administrator where you've retained you know, your copyright, but you designated them to do these sort of actions for you? If the answer to both of those is no, then you're self-administered. So you're it. It's up to you. Um, you might be both if, like, I'm in this situation. If you have some songs that are with a publisher, but others that you control, you should join the MLC because you need to be able to collect on the ones that you control. The ones that you have with a publisher, the publisher will collect those and you'll get paid that way. Alex, could I ask a quick question from the chat? Yeah. Uh, will aggregators automatically submit to MLCs like they do to PROs, CD Baby specifically? So that's not a question I can answer because they have different levels of services. Like there's a level of CD Baby I think DistroKid too, where you can opt into them doing publishing admin for you, but there's also a level of service where they don't do any of that. So you want to double check with them what they are actually doing, and then you can determine if you need to do the MLC or if they're doing it for you. Um, I have a note on the bottom of, of this slide. It's really important that you do check with your distribution chain and see what's already happened because you don't want to duplicate the data. That's just going to make a mess for everyone to sort out later. But each of those aggregators, some of them do it. I think like Song Trust, you can opt into having them collect stuff too. You might be with a foreign CMO 
Like there's one in the UK that I know a lot of writers are part of. And you can go back to them and tell them you don't want them to collect for the U.S. anymore and you want the MLC to do it. So there's some complication to specific situations, but it's not a blanket statement, pun not intended, that we can um, say that those aggregators are doing that or are not doing that. You'll have to check with them to be sure. Um, someone is editing my screen. Interesting. Um, so this is the final slide here. This is the to-do list. So to protect your musical work, join a PRO if you're not already with one and register your works there. Join the MLC. Um, right now they're in a period where they're still building the database. They're still working on onboarding stuff. And they started with the largest rights holders because there's a lot of data to move over. And so that's, it's not open that you can just, you know, pop over there and sign up yet. That will be functional soon. But in the meantime, like visit the website, check it out, start collecting your information and getting it together. So you're ready to register your works when you're able to um, register the copyrights to protect the sound recording, join sound exchange. If you're the only performer and also the owner of the sound recording, you're going to collect all of that from sound exchange but you have to register with them to do that and then also register the copyright to the sound recording um there's a, a neat thing if you own both the musical work and the sound recording you can save a little bit of money there's a special way to register the copyright for that otherwise it's 65 dollars for every single song every single work and if you do both together you can do it on one application and only pay that one time. There's also, if you haven't already released your music, there's a way to do several at a time. Like if you have an album of unpublished works ready to go, you can do up to 10 on one application and do both the sound recording and the composition at the same time that way. Okay, I see a question. Yeah, so if you're already with Sound Exchange, do you need to do anything with the MLC? Yes, Sound Exchange is not overlapping with the MLC at all. Um, they are collecting a royalty for you that's coming from Spotify, but that's your sound recording royalty. That's not your mechanical royalty. If you want to get the mechanicals, you need to join the MLC. And that's a lot of independent writers have been missing out on mechanicals for years because of this system that was difficult. So join the MLC and get those pennies. I think we can open it up for questions. I talked a little longer than I thought I would, but we're still good on time. 